Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session of the uh, Harassers Global Meeting 2022. Uh, and like the past few uh, years, or a couple, last couple of years, we are continuing to do this uh, terrific conference in virtual format. Uh, and in true Harassers style, we have a panel that is, uh, you know, comprised of members from all over the world, various parts of the world. And what we are here to talk about today is a very important topic. We are here to talk about sustainable growth and what it means for the world, why it's important for us to focus on sustainable growth. And we are also here to talk about how uh, technology and technological transformation can be used uh, to bring about sustainable growth in this increasingly changing world, a very dynamic world, I must say. And as we all know, sustainable growth is a very, very uh, important topic. Um, the world took cognizance of it uh, quite a while ago, but initially, as many, uh, many of us know, the term sustainable growth was largely related uh, to uh, economic sort of factors. So it, it used to be pegged to, you know, sustainable growth used to be uh, defined as something wherein a company or a country is able to deliver a certain level of growth on a consistent basis, on a sustainable basis, and therefore the term sustainable growth. So, but it was always pegged to economic factors like profitability, GDP growth, and so on and so forth. But uh, over the last three decades, I would say starting maybe in the 90s, and especially in the last two decades, the definition of this term has become very broad, and it has been broadened to include factors like you know, ethical factors, social responsibility, accountability, uh, you know, thinking about the future generations, that feeling of uh, you know, commitment to the future generation, and so on and so forth. And therefore, uh, the whole notion of sustainable growth started getting uh, slightly broadened and companies and uh, I mean, leaders of companies and leaders of countries were, uh, you know, starting to measure themselves, uh, you know, to a higher benchmark. I mean, it goes without saying that if you just have to achieve sustainable growth that is focused only on economics, that is far easier to do, arguably, then if you have to achieve it and yet be, uh, you know, ethical in your practices, yet be inclusive and yet be uh, taking care of other parts of the planet that are lesser privileged and so on and so forth. And yet what is heartening is that over the last two decades in particular, there has been a progressive increase in acceptance amongst, amongst global leaders and amongst corporate leaders in understanding that this is a very important way of growing, uh, you know, uh, to look at sustainable growth as a more responsible uh, endeavor. And, and one of the biggest reasons in my view that has happened that, you know, global leaders or corporate leaders have started placing more and more emphasis on sustainable growth being a more, uh, you know, more broad-based thing than merely on economic uh, profitability is the fact that technology has played a huge role in making it more, uh, you know, uh, visible. Hey, technology, guys. Hi. Technology has brought uh, people together. To the, uh, and it has brought, for, I mean, a good example of this is you have social media today wherein, uh, you know, the common people are able to interact with leaders. You know, if 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 uh, if if a uh, if a you know president of the U.S. is embarking on a certain uh, you know action, he or she gets instant feedback, and what is going to happen about that from people? And so, uh, you know, issues like climate change and sustainable growth and ensuring that we uh, take care of the planet at a broader level while in, while being focused on the profitability have become much more important because leaders see the need to now 
you know, be seen as being responsible as much as, as being profitable leaders. So technology has empowered that, technology has transformed that. And therefore, it is increasingly important. And why are we here to talk about it again today? It is because the last two years have brought upon us a couple of very important crises. The first one obviously was a pandemic. Much has uh, been talked and written about this subject, so I won't go into why it is a transformational event. It hardly needs explaining. It has been a very, very uh, important factor or an event. And, and more recent events like the Russia-Ukraine war and other geopolitical uh, strains that keep you know, uh, crop, cropping up every now and then. Now, because of events like these, once again, there's a focus on sustainable development. And, and therefore, we are here today to talk about how we can use technology to uh, bring about sustainable growth in a deeper way. Why technology? Because undoubtedly, technology has proven to be the most influential factor. It has proven to be the single largest driving factor that has driven change, that has driven transformational change in societies across the world. So for that, today we have a panel, a very, very accomplished panel, if I may. Everyone on this panel other than me is highly accomplished, and they are from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, com coming from different backgrounds, but they all are focused in different ways on contributing to using technology for bringing about impact in a meaningful fashion around the world. So it gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce my panel for today. And uh, one of the panelists is... Um, maybe uh, not joined at all. We, we, we probably don't have one of our panelists yet. But uh, first we have Payal. Payal Dalal, she is the Senior Vice President of Social Impact and International Markets at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Payal is based in London and she oversees the center's philanthropic investments around the globe and she manages the center's international team. So prior to joining MasterCard, she had a long and accomplished career in international philanthropy uh, and politics, you know, working in a range of public and private sector organizations uh, on the you know, interplay between politics and international philanthropy. So Payal, welcome to the panel today. Next, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Tofi Saliba. Tofi is the CEO of uh, Toda Network, Right, and he's the creator of the Toda uh, Internet Protocol, a new age IP that seeks to eliminate dependency on intermediaries, and thereby enhancing efficiency of internet usage and all, everything that it can be used for by all, as much as 99 percent. He's also the president of the decentralized AI network, and clearly, uh, Tofi, you are in the thick of things as far as the digital. Uh, you know, revolution is concerned. So, uh, you know, delighted to welcome you to this panel today. Thank you. That Next, you. absolutely. Next, we have Victor Margin, who's not yet joined us, I, and I hope he does, but I'll introduce him to save time later. Uh, Victor is the founder and CEO of a company called Maco Robotics. It's a leading Spanish food tech company that is redefining the hospitality space with its robotic solutions. Their robotic solutions work closely with hospitality partners. Uh, and, you know, they, they are making a big impact in Spain and Europe. And uh, they have also, under Victor's uh, leadership, uh, grown to other markets like India and Singapore. Uh, so Victor is based in the beautiful city of uh, Sevilla, one of my favorite cities in Spain. I hope he's able to join us and talk about the robotics angle because... I do think that is a very important uh, part of the, uh, you know, technology transformation ecosystem. And so uh, welcome to the panel as well, I hope, uh, Victor. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Ganesh Natarajan. Ganesh is the executive chairman and founder of 5F World, a platform for digital startups, skills, and social ventures in India. He's had a long and successful career where he's co-founded several initiatives, 
and he also serves on the boards of numerous leading companies, including as chairman of the uh, of uh, Honeywell Formation India Private Limited. He has authored as many as 11 books, and he's a regular speaker at several conferences, including, of course, uh, our Horaces conferences. Welcome, Ganesh, uh, to yet another Horaces event. Thank you. And lastly, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Maxim Kislev. Maxim is a professor of practice in the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Skoltek. He's based in uh, Moscow, and of course, uh, which has long been a center of you know scientific and research innovation in the world. He, in addition, also serves as the Director General at the Human Capital Development Foundation under the government of Moscow. He is also the managing partner of a firm called MK Analytics Consulting and Training, which is a full spectrum uh, management consulting, a community management and communications consulting firm that he founded. So again, Maxim, welcome from Moscow. And uh, I look forward to uh, having all of your views. So the way we are going to do this uh, panel discussion is we have 45 minutes, which is uh, frankly, and uh, never enough time uh, to get all the insights from such a stellar panel, but we'll have to make do with what we have. Uh, so I request everybody to keep your responses to each of the questions to under three minutes. Uh, so the, uh, and the way we are gonna do this is I will be throwing one generic question that is relating to this topic to all of you. So it's a common question for all of you. And then I will also be throwing one specific question to each of you based on your respective backgrounds and expertise. So I will first start with Maxim uh, with a generic question. The question is, you know, digital technologies, as I'm sure all of us agree, can be a very powerful tool with major potential for transformation. And they have been proven to be so time and again across the world. Their impact can be even more amplified in the times of crisis than in normal times. So never in recent memory, as we all will agree, has the term crisis seemed more relevant than over the last two, three years. We had the pandemic, we had several waves of the pandemic, we had countries recovering, we had countries getting very overconfident about the recovery, we had countries going back into the pandemic, we have seen it all with the pandemic. But unfortunately, the human cost of the pandemic has been huge. Uh, but the pandemic arguably also has thrown up a lot of opportunity uh, to retrospect, uh, to introspect and to think about how, uh, you know, we can do things in a different way. So the question, therefore, is that while technology can be very, very powerful as a disrupting force uh, uh, to attain sustainable growth, if not properly tapped, technology can also become uh, the cost of a huge digital divide and in turn spawn huge inequities in the world. So I want uh, to ask each of you this question. You know, how do you see societies and organizations globally bringing about digital transformation in an effective but also equitable manner? So first, I would like to pose this question to Maxim. Okay, thank you, Vijay. Well, this is a huge question, of course, but I will confine myself to these three minutes that you gave us. Uh, well, first of all, I uh, believe that, uh, you know, well, we live in the world of digitalization. And whether we like it or not, this is something that cannot be turned back. And this is something which greatly defines our age, I would say. And if you think about that, you know, like lots of spheres, over the past, let's say, 10, 20 years, they changed dramatically. They changed to almost being unrecognized. And right now, digitalization, well, whether we call it different names, well, some of the times we can call it automatization, and that will be very close, robotization, whatever. But we speak about the technologies that are certainly altering our lives to the great extent. And uh, if the question is what we are looking uh, to meet or to handle in the future, 
I would say this process will not stop and all of the areas that might be taken by artificial intelligence and that might be taken by robots, let me place it directly, they will become, I would say, inhumanized or unhumanized. Again, we can talk, for many years I have been dealing with something what is called robo-ethics. Robo-ethics, like I'm a psychologist, so this is about ethical, psychological, and social issues uh, associated with uh, developments in robotics, right? And, uh, well, uh, certainly all of these things, they pose lots of, I would say, issues. On the one hand, we make our lives a lot more convenient and comfortable, uh, which is, we may say, good for the sustainable growth and everything. Well, because a lot of areas, they take less of the human labor, they can less of resource spendings and so forth, right? And you name it, so many areas that were transformed thanks to digitalization to these uh, very recognizable benefits, right? On the other hand, well, lots of the studies, they would show that some of the, I would say, uh, human qualities, they also become altered. Well, to give you a very simple example of that, if you are using, there were the studies showing that if you are using, for instance, Google Glass, that would make video of everything what you see. But the more you do that, the less stays in your memory. Well, with the simple, very simple argument, well, we try to delegate our efforts, our human efforts, to the technologies. And if I ask each of each of you, well, how many telephone numbers do you remember? Well, right now, that will be very, very limited, I believe, uh, uh, list of the numbers which means that, again, technologies, uh, they bear both. Well, lots of advantages and comfort, but at the same time, they might be associated with kind of significant risks for us. What does it mean? And right now, I, I will be very quick on that. Well, it means that right now we have to reconsider lots of the things in education, in human development, that would be able for the coming generation or the future generations to really, I would say, like encounter the challenges brought about by technologies. That, that's it for, for, for the general question that you asked. Thank you. No, that's that's a wonderful uh, set of opening remarks. I think, uh, you know, the point you raised about robo-ethics and about whether uh, you know technology should become something uh, that we as a human race become over reliant on is very very pertinent from an ethical standpoint and also from an over consumption standpoint i would add because sometimes the more technology you have the more uh, useless things you desire and sometimes it doesn't always solve good problems sometimes it solves needless problems uh, I don't want to stoke controversy by giving examples of what are needless uh, because it will upset some people who are putting tremendous amount of effort into them. Uh, but uh, undoubtedly, uh, I think, uh, you know, what you say is very relevant. Thank you for those opening remarks, uh, Maxim. And with that, uh, I will uh, throw the same question uh, to Payal. Thank you very much for all of you today. Um, so for me, it's about how do we ensure inclusive digitalization? So making sure that everyone everywhere can really benefit from the digital economy. And I think one thing is really clear and that that's that digitalization was really accelerated by the pandemic. And so those who weren't part of the digital economy were even farther left behind. So if I think about the big issues of our day, which are income inequality and information inequality, I think we also have to add digital inequality because digital inequality will exacerbate income and information inequality. 
And so for me, the thing that I'm really thinking about as I'm thinking about digital inequality and inclusive digitalization is how we really make sure that micro and small businesses are able to participate fully in the digital economy and really benefit from all of the digitalization and technologies out there. I think we have to, as, as private sector, as public sector, as civil society, really think about how we can help micro and small businesses to digitalize. Um, and that means a range of things from ensuring equal access to broadband and data to building digital skills, to building confidence and trust, and really making sure that digital tools and platforms are designed with micro and small businesses in mind. I think what we see a lot of is that technology and tools are really made for larger businesses, for, for the medium businesses and for the global corporates. And so that means that tools and technologies simply aren't fit for purpose when it comes to micro business and small business. And so I think that's one of the roles of all sectors to think about how do we design technologies with micro businesses in mind. And of course, we have to go further. We have to be really segment intentional. So women entrepreneurs look at technology slightly different from male entrepreneurs. Those in rural contexts look at technology differently than those in urban and peri or peri-urban. And so I think that's one of the things that we can do in addition to ensuring equal access to, to broadband and data is really making sure that we're, we're taking a human centered approach. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is that the imperative to digitalize is certainly much more urgent. Um, and so that means is that we as you know, various sectors, I represent the private sector, we have to partner together to be able to really operate at scale and be able to bring the millions and millions and millions of micro and small businesses around the world into the digital economy. Um, so I'll stop there because I know we're short on time, um, but I look forward to, to um, follow up questions and the rest of the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Pyle, for that. That was an excellent uh, you know, set of opening remarks from you as well. Uh, and you know, the good part is you touched upon the one segment that often gets missed out, which is the small or medium sized businesses, and they need to be solved for in a much bigger scale. And I agree with you uh, that the opportunity there is much better. And, uh, you know, I would love to have a back and forth with you, but, you know, cognizant of the time being short, uh, I will throw the same question now uh, to, I mean, I mean uh, to Ganesh. And Ganesh, what do you think of it from your perspective? I mean, you see a lot of Indian startups and Indian companies that you work with. So uh, I'd love to get your perspective on this. Yeah, thanks, Vijay. Yeah. I'll start off by agreeing with Pyle because uh, one thing we've noticed over the last maybe eight, nine years of digital transformation is that there has been some kind of a digital divide because people mm -hmm. who had the ability to invest big time in business, business process innovation, technology, culture, were certainly winning the game. But one good thing that's happened, particularly in India, because I do a mm -hmm. lot of work with the government and the Ministry of Information Technology. And I think there's a very visionary idea called Digital India. Mm -hmm. We're saying that while the country is aspiring to be a 5 trillion GDP economy, hopefully by 2026, the digital component of that could be a trillion. And as sure. you know, we have very flourishing IT services, offshore outsourcing industry, which is 200 billion, which will probably go up to about 350 billion. But the 650 billion will come from digital platforms. We already have a very, very successful payments platform called UPI, which has spawned a whole bunch of startups and even some of the big banks, including the State Bank of India, which I serve on the board, is very focused on digital for payments, etc. And the good news is, in fact, I have a meeting just after this with visionaries in the government who are thinking through this, but potentially there will be digital platforms which connect up the entire ecosystem, large companies, smaller SMEs, which Payal mentioned, and in a very inclusive kind of manner, which is what we're talking about here. And that will be right from uh, low cost manufacturing to uh, financial services, of course, the whole gamut beyond payments. We are looking at education. We ourselves are participating in skills in a big way. And the advantage of that is those themselves could add about $650 billion to the economy. In fact, we are now kind of looking at 5G in the next few years, adding almost a trillion dollars to the economy and also trying to be pioneer. Yesterday, our prime minister launched 
uh, the first research towards 6G. So I think a combination of universally available telecom, I mean, the good old days, I'm sure some of you would India would remember, we even had a tough time getting a telephone and then a dial tone on that telephone. So things have moved a long way since. And I think the mobile phone is ubiquitous. So with mobile there, cloud access very much available. I think they're leapfrogging and we are moving from technology only for the haves to very much including the have-nots. And to your earlier point on ESG, I think most organizations have an ESG agenda. I was talking to a very large IT services company this morning and they have a by 2030, they want to be net zero. And of course, the prime minister has committed that by 2070 will be net zero. As many of you know, India is still largely dependent on fossil fuels. But as we move towards that, my belief is digital will not only be, I mean, something that you absolutely can't avoid, but digital will be embraced by every corporation, small, medium, large. Digital will be embraced by every component of society. I mean, they're already building platforms that will enable, you know, very poor people in the slum communities in various cities to access better skills through digital. And most important, I think we will have a government and a corporate sector collaborating on digital. So I'm very excited about the opportunities of digital. I really believe the sustainability movement in the country and hopefully in the world will be powered by digital. And we look forward to seeing that happening. So I'll stop here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. That is actually some excellent points as well. And I agree with you. And especially the point that you make uh, about transformational leaps, basically leapfrogging from, you know, not even having landline connections to every uh, every Tom, Dick, and Harry having telephones and not just having uh, cell phones, but having, uh, you know, internet connections of a reasonable speed, 4G uh, and so on, which has become a reality in India today. And, and, and if I were to compare, I see Africa going in a very similar direction. And Africa is the next, you know, bigger thing, biggest thing that is probably going to become an opportunity where, uh, which is ripe for transformation. Uh, with that, I will, uh, you know, throw the same question to Tofi. Uh, I'd love to get your views. Sure, thank you. Um, every time somebody unmutes, I think there's some noise. So, um, but I think the subject gets adjusted, uh, which is pretty good. Um, I think something that is uh, extremely important that uh, a lot of folks are not paying attention to, which I try to bring into the equation. Um, I suggested it to the IEEE about three years ago, and it took about six months to convince a lot of folks that there needs to be something done. And uh, and that's along many different things that I do, which uh, I am the author of Toda IP, and Toda IP is uh, being implemented by a lot of companies for peer-to-peer communication of uh, value, which is great. But uh, in parallel to things, I do uh, something for the IEEE, uh, the IEEE is not for profit. For those that don't know, it's the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. It's the largest in the world, 400,000 members. Uh, and what I, the reason why I suggested the following to the IEEE, because uh, it is uh, geared for all humanity. It's not a certain political agenda that it's uh, just uh, the United States and forget about the Chinese or just the Chinese, forget about the Russians or whatnot and suggested it to be in South Korea because it's also geopolitically, it can work. And the following is, is basically international protocols for AI security. Uh, and here we're not talking about AI ethics, we're talking about AI security to prevent attacks from within. And what do we mean by that? When you're looking at the, the acceleration of uh, digital transformation, uh, now a lot of uh, folks what they don't pay attention to is the attack from within. And what do we mean by that? So imagine um, one day you wake up and you realize that there's a single app that you've always trusted in your phone. It has a lot of AI, as you all know, there's a lot of battles around AI that how who's going to get there first. And, um, and the AI there is able to not gather your information from a privacy perspective. Privacy is a concern, but don't worry about that. What I'm going to tell you is more about your willpower can be taken away from you without you even realizing. Uh, there, are, there are over 99 scenarios that you put in front of folks that they don't, haven't even thought of 
of how impactful it can be. Um, it can uh, literally be weaponized against people in a, in a sense that it can be um, extremely dangerous from the perspective of having a single entity controlling certain AI to enslave people, for example, or to get them to think that there is something happening versus something else, getting people to go against each other uh, intentionally. Now, sometimes some things can happen unintentionally using AI as well. And I'm going to give you guys an example, and you're going to be like, what? It's actually happening. There's something that the biggest bifurcation in human history happened in front of all of your eyes in the last couple of years. That bifurcation is effectively each and every one of you. I know for certainty, you know, folks that you trust and you know that they're extremely intellectual, but yet some of them, they believe that the vaccine is really good. Others, they believe that it's not. Okay. That bifurcation is caused by the unintended consequential of AI, where it gets, because it's driven by the click. If somebody suggests a certain thing that they get to go in more in this direction, no. That's unintended. But an ill intended is listening and watching all of these things. It can gather this information and can use it to weaponize and getting people to go against each other. That's one of the weaponized things. It could be the end of our civilization in front of our eyes. And I'm not talking about 30, 40 years. I'm talking by 2030. There could be existential threat that not a lot of people paying attention to. I don't talk about those things in public way to scare the rest of the world. We're not supposed to be doing that. But in events like Horasis and other places, we do talk about this. We have, have over 1,000 attendees coming to Busan, South Korea uh, on September 28, 29, and 30. Uh, and uh, more and more we would be talking about it, but not in a way to bring it to the mainstream because it's just going to scare people without having a solution. The intent there is that we are building research center to, to enable AI scientists to build AI in a way that it cannot be repurposed. And if you ask that to any AI scientist today, tell them, can you do that? They say it's impossible, it cannot be done. But is it worth the shot to try to have research to make it possible by showing you 99 scenarios that can be existential threat to our civilization? Is it worth the shot? And the answer is yes, and it's an initiative that's probably going to cost us $2 billion. It's one of my things that I do give back to society. It's not uh, a, there's, there's no way you can benefit from the I uh, E. So, so that's something that I, I want to bring into the equation from the acceleration of digital transformation that I feel uh, we need to pay attention uh, for, and hopefully in the inclusion that Bayal brought as well, that you can in, uh, incorporate a lot of... Uh, uh, things from the governance perspective mm. that, that can include a lot, a lot of people. So I always look for feedback for folks, uh, you know, like uh, Payal to uh, perhaps uh, help and see certain angles that we haven't really looked at. So uh, that's my take on this. Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't mean to be negative. AI can be the best thing ever happened to our humanity. I want to ensure that that's what it ha what's going to happen. I'm optimistic that it will. But if we don't address those risks, it won't. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Tofi. Effectively, the message is AI is the next nuke, can be the next nuke. It can either you know, save the world or it can destroy the world, depending on who gets hold of it and for what. Yeah. Thank you for that very interesting take. Uh, I just want to point to everybody the housekeeping issue. We have about 10 minutes left for this, 11 minutes left for the session. So I'm going to dive right into the you know specific questions. Um, you know, of course, I had some questions for uh, uh, Victor as well, who's not been able to join, but so I'm going to skip that. So let's start uh, with Ganesh, uh, the specific questions. So Ganesh, you're in the thick of this whole digitization and, you know, social impact thing that's going on in India right now. You're obviously, uh, you know, uh, involved in advising, you know, parts of the government, parts of the startup ecosystem and so on. Can you tell me about one or two challenges that, you know, typically you have seen that Indian digital startups face, and especially those that focus on impact-oriented problems, and how have you dealt with them? 
See, that's a good question. Because one of the big problems we find, a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in fintech, and also now in edtech and health tech. And you will you will hear in the last few um, weeks that some of the techs have been laying off people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think one problem that is being faced today is there is still a lack of uh, motivation, if you will to use technology. I mean, it's, I mean, COVID, of course, was a necessitator. So I mean, a lot of people in education had to be at home. Similarly, a lot of very senior citizens access their doctors through. But now there's this tendency to go back. I mean, we see it in the bank that they want to go back and get their passbooks printed and so on and so forth. And similarly, people are going back to schools. So I think there's one challenge to prepare digital for a hybrid economy. Because we know, there is no such thing as going back to the old normal. But the new normal will see a coexistence of physical and digital, what my friend, the chairman of Tata Sons called digital. And I think, I think the real challenge people are facing, not only in the social sector, but even in the corporate sector or the education sector, is to build solutions where there can be a service component or a service component attached to it, where people are not going to go back to purely physical, but also they want to kind of experiment and they want to communicate. So to give you just one quick example, I mean, we're now investing in a platform called Skills Alpha, which actually enables AI to be used for the person to say what would they be good at as a skill. And then going right through the process of, you know, adaptive learning where they can actually choose video. I mean, even if, if, you, if you learn more through video, you show, you'll get more video. And find a peer group, find a mentor who's three years older than you, find a coach, and all this through technology. So I think people will have to adapt their solutions. And one challenge is being faced that, you know, if you have a cookie cutter technology first and technology only approach to digital, it's not going to work. And one of the books right behind me on the shelf that we just published actually talks about how do you craft new customer journeys? How do you change business processes? How do you look at data and analytics in a very prescriptive, predictive fashion? Look at skills and culture and weave all that through appropriate technology. As you rightly said, AI can be a nuke. So can augmented reality. So can metaverse. But if you plan for the technology and make it a touch point to a future direction that we're going to go, I think we can be successful. Absolutely. Thanks for that, uh, Ganesh. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, the buzzword used to, you know, when all the companies started globalizing, the buzzword used to be global. And the new buzzword, I think, is digital, uh, which you just alluded to. I think all of us are going to be hearing a lot of that word uh, in the next decade or so. Uh, I'd like to throw the next question to uh, Payal. You know, Payal, uh, you all at MasterCard, you set up this uh, Strive community. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's obviously a very fascinating uh, and very relevant project, like I said, to focus on, uh, you know, providing or solving for the small to medium businesses. And I think it's great that you all are doing it. Same question to you. I mean, what are some of the one or two unique challenges that you've seen in your mission to take these businesses digital, these small to medium sized businesses? Yeah, absolutely. Micro and small. Um, so we don't focus on meat. So usually um, enterprises from, from one to 10 in, in terms of employees. Um, I'd say there, there are a couple of challenges. Um, the first is blending tech and touch. So you can't actually, even though we're working on digitalization of micro and small businesses, you can't actually do that entirely digital because trust is so important. And so that means you do need some degree of touch. And depending on what segment you're working with, that touch is going to be different. Those touch requirements will be different. And so that that is a conundrum. It requires a lot of needs assessment. It requires a lot of iteration, a lot of design um, with user feedback to really understand, you know, what, what's going to be effective. We can't just assume because we're trying to drive digitalization that everything can happen, everything can happen digitally. So that's the, that's the first challenge and also opportunity and learning. Um, the second, and I alluded to it before, is around trust um, because trust is really challenging and it's something that is earned over time. And there are so many opportunities when it comes to digital, but there are so many pitfalls as well. Um, so micro and small businesses have to trust their ability and their competencies. They have to trust that these tools are going to work and that the cost is going to be justified by the benefits. They have to trust that these, um, these tools will actually 
be responsive to their needs and continue to deliver value over time. And these are just a few of the examples of what micro and small businesses need to trust for. Um, and, and trust is tough. Um, and, you know, it, and it, because it's rooted in behavior change, I think one of the pitfalls of international development is to assume digitalization is a skilling problem. And it's not. It's about how do you change an organization's behavior um, and manage their business. And then the last challenge and opportunity, which, again, I've said previously, is that we really have to be segment intentional. And this is specifically focused around gender um, in addition to location, in addition to, to all the other segmentations. What we found in our work. Um, VJ, is that you can't just have kind of a gender neutral approach if you want equal outcomes for women entrepreneurs and male entrepreneurs. You actually have to think about the different constraints that women entrepreneurs might face that prevent them from participating into programs or prevent them from adopting technology. So just a few of the, the challenges and opportunities and learnings that we've, um, we've surfaced through our Strive Community Program, which is really about how do we help micro and small businesses digitalize their operations, better use digital financial services, and really access these new digital platforms for new consumers. Thanks, Wael. I think I completely agree with you that, you know, uh, this segment is extremely difficult to solve for. Uh, and, you know, also because, you know, the trust, earning the trust is not easy both ways. And equally, uh, you know, this segment requires a lot of hand-holding, so it's very high maintenance. And yet, in the short to medium term, the returns are going to be almost zero. So it's going to take a lot of patience and focus to solve for them. And therefore, I must congratulate all of you at, uh, you know, MasterCard Group for doing this uh, in a sustained way. So thank you for uh, answering that. Uh, Maxim, the next specific question is going to be for you. Uh, obviously, you know, we're all very intrigued to understand from you uh, how, if, if at all, the situation is any different or if, if not, then more of the same in Russia. You're obviously, uh, you, know, uh, you know, wearing two hats there. One as a professor, as a part of Skoltek, and also your, uh, you know, NGO hat. Uh, but both sides, you're, you're, you're looking at issues that are, you know, looking at sustainable growth and sustainable change in society. And how do you see uh, yourselves, um, you know, dealing with the challenges that Russian entrepreneurs, for example, face uh, or Russian businesses face when it comes to embrace technology or creating these kind of new technologies and how do they use it for social change? Well, thank you for this question. I will try to, to really uh, confine myself to one minute. Uh, but uh, you see, there are two sides of that. One side is what is going on in Russia right now. And this is truly a very, very massive crisis. And this is not just the crisis uh, or political turmoil well, with the war against Ukraine, uh, which is certainly not supported by most of the people of my circle. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know anyone who would support that. But, but uh, you know, like the propaganda, the official propaganda would say the majority of people, they, they do. I don't believe it. But in any case, one thing is that Russia is now challenged very dramatically by uh, technologists leading the country. And this is the huge challenge because, you know, like Russia was not prepared and Russian businesses, small or big, they were not prepared to lose some of the things they were so used to just in a moment of time, just just like that. For instance, leaving Absolutely. Russia, well, that's for most of the corporations, this is a huge, huge, huge loss. On the other hand, on the other hand, well, there is a number of things that are being done here, but it takes time to replace lots of these things that Russia is now losing. How it will go, nobody knows at the moment. Nobody can predict. Well, uh, for, for each of us right now, well, the sanctions that are placed totally fairly, and I, I, it might sound very strange, but I do support the sanctions against the government because I uh, do not support this war, of course. But it placed a lot of burden on each of us. So that's, okay. that's about it. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Maxim. 
you know, I would love to ask one more question to Tofi, and but I'm not sure it'll get streamed because I got a message saying our session has, uh, you know, elapsed. But the question I wanted to ask you, Tofi, and maybe I can take it up offline with you, is I want to understand how uh, you think Toda IP will help bridge the di digital divide. And we can talk about that offline. I would have loved to post this question I, to your I, panel, but I, I got a message I, saying. I yeah. can tell you it's very short. With a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, value exchange, the very short answer to that is efficient justice everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is it. Efficient justice everywhere. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the abrupt ending. I tried to make it, but you know, this is really short time for five people. And I don't know what we would have done if Victor had joined as well. <laughs> but it has been a wonderful session. I really enjoyed sharing this. And thanks, everybody, for this. Likewise. I look forward to meeting you all in the next physical yeah, version. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Harasses needs to go physical as well, Ganesh. Physical. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.